Good evening. Welcome and thank you coming out, uh, for coming out tonight, whether by choice, compulsion, or bribery. It's nice to see everybody here. <laughs> Um, tonight's lecture is the second uh, lecture that we've been able to offer uh, through the Science and Race grant from the Templeton Foundation, so we're very pleased uh, to have Dr. Ryan Patrick McLaughlin with us um, tonight. Uh, before I introduce Dr. McLaughlin, I want to point out that there's cookies and lemonade and tea and coffee on the back table. You are welcome to that if you need that throughout the lecture. Um, you're welcome to get up and, and grab yourself some refreshments. So, uh, tonight, introducing Dr. Ryan Patrick McLaughlin, who received his doctorate in theology from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In 2014, he served as visiting assistant professor of religious ethics at Siena College from 2014 to 2017. And he presently teaches courses in theological ethics at Merrimack College in North Andover, Massachusetts. Since 2014, Dr. McLaughlin has served as an associate fellow of the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics, and, spoke at his, and he spoke as an invited expert at the inaugural summer conference on, the animal, on animal ethics at Oxford University. Dr. McLaughlin's research interests are in constructive theology and Christian ethics. He is particularly concerned with developing a constructive theological framework that adequately addresses non-human ethics, including both environmental and animal ethics. But he's also published broadly in fields including environmental ethics, animal ethics, comparative religious ethics, interreligious dialogue, feminist biblical hermeneutics, and biblical studies, in journals including Modern Theology, the Journal of Religious Ethics, and the Journal of Animal Ethics. Dr. McLaughlin is author of Preservation and Protest, Theological Foundations for an Eco-Eschatological Ethics, Fortress Press 2014, and Christian Theology and the Status of Animals, The Dominant Tradition and Its Alternatives, Palgrave Macmillan 2014. At present, he is finishing a manuscript entitled Celebration and Lament, Divine Goodness and Natural Evil, uh, under contract with Fortress Press. Tonight's lecture is drawn from this ongoing research and will address the theological challenges of natural evil within a scientifically informed framework. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ryan Patrick McLaughlin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I want to begin by, uh, Jake, that was a wonderful introduction. I, thank you for that. Uh, well, it's probably good because I, I also wrote some of it, so that was very <laughs> kind of you to say those things to me. Um, I also want to thank the John Templeton Foundation uh, for providing the Science and Seminary Grant, uh, St. Pius X Seminary for supporting the grant and this particular event, um, the Archbishop uh, uh, Cusera Center uh, for co-sponsoring the event, and uh, Professor Jake Hul uh, Kuhlhaus and Chris uh, Laminer, uh, sorry, Lammer Heindel uh, for inviting me, uh, the students who have put up with me for well more than they should have to uh, for today, and Loris College in general uh, for, for welcoming me here, and all of you for coming out. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> so let's get right into it, shall we? The Greek philosopher Epicurus stated, if God is not able and willing to prevent evil, then God fails to meet the philosophical criteria of being God. But if God is both able and willing to prevent evil, then evil wouldn't exist. But evil does exist. Ergo, and you have to say ergo because that sounds more appropriate for Epicurus, God must not exist. And this logical version of the problem of evil uh, has been around for quite some time and has been defended uh, and developed by modern philosophers including David Hume and John Mackey. Other philosophers, such as William Rowe, have developed a softer argument. These arguments do not fo focus on the existence of evil in general, but rather uh, specific types of evil, what Marilyn McCord Adams would call horrendous evils. These evils stymie uh, or obliterate the flourishing of the creature who suffers them, 
uh, such that one might reasonably believe that, all things considered, this creature does not count her own life as a good. And these types of evils may not prove that God does not exist, but they are nonetheless, they constitute evidence against God's existence. So these forms of uh, the problem of evil are called evidential arguments. But they all have to do with whether or not God exists. Now the title of this talk is not natural evil and the existence of God. It's natural evil and the guilt of God. And we can take a vote as to which title would be worse later on. But the wording of this title accurately reflects that I'm not here concerned with the logical problem of evil. I'm not seeking to prove or disprove the existence of God. In fact, I'm assuming God's existence in a kind of a thought experiment that reflects a personal faith commitment. That is, God, and more specifically the God of the Judeo-Christian tradition, exists. My interest in the evidential problem of evil is also limited because, again, I'm not really interested in, in the question of whether or not we can prove God exists. Although I am concerned with the evidence available to us about God's righteousness. So for that sense, the, the evidential problem will be important for me. But in this talk, I'm mainly concerned with what we'll call the existential or experiential problem of evil. The question of how our encounter of the world should shape and affect our encounter with God. The most famous or infamous uh, account of this flavor of the problem of evil comes to us from uh, Ivan Karamazov of Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov, although uh, Elie Wiesel's work is also quite powerful on this front. Now Ivan focuses, when he talks to his brother Alyosha, uh, upon the, uh, the evils that adults visit upon children. And he includes an example of a child being hunted by dogs, a child being forced by her parents to eat her own excrement while freezing in a cold shack. And after posing these examples, Ivan asks the question, can there be any good that comes from such evils? Any reason that God may have in permitting them that makes them acceptable to us such that God is exonerated? And Ivan's answer is a resounding no. Even a perfect eschatological harmony, argues Ivan, cannot justify the horror of a young child so abused by her parents. And so while Ivan does not deny God's existence, he wants nothing to do with God. He seeks to return his ticket to whatever heavenly destination this world is heading toward because the cost of heaven is too high, even if it's just that one tortured child. Ivan refuses to pay the cost, and he refuses to accept that those poor children have paid a disproportional cost for him. And he refuses to embrace the God who has allowed those children to pay the cost in such deplorable manners. Now, Ivan's examples are horrific, but they're not without footing in reality. Indeed, uh, he got his examples, as uh, uh, Dr. Cole also mentioned earlier, from news stories. So he didn't make them up. And we can still do this today. In 2014, police in Chester County, PA, responded to a report of child abuse. Upon arriving at the residence, they discovered a three-year-old boy who had been, quote, beaten with blunt and sharp objects, whipped, taped to a chair with electrical tape and beaten, hung by his feet and beaten, leading to his death. The mother and her boyfriend explained that they did these things to their toddler because he refused to eat his breakfast. And for that refusal, he received three days of torture, all on top of a life filled with abuses of other kinds. It's absolutely devastating to consider that the last thing this child knew was his own mother torturing him, and no one, divine or human, intervening on his behalf. Now this example, you'll notice that this talk is natural evil in the guilt of God. This example doesn't qualify as natural evil. Uh, I'll develop what I mean by natural evil in a bit, but suffice it here to say that natural evil is evil that results from amoral sources, diseases, natural disasters. Um, the example of this poor child appears to fall more under the rubric of what we'll call moral evil, which, is, uh, evil, which entails evil that results from a moral agent's abuse of freedom. Still, the example does highlight the depth of anguish the evidence of reality can present to us. And there are examples of natural evils that facilitate an existential crisis vis-a-vis -vis our relationship with God. The recent earthquake in Mexico City left children buried alive amid the rubble of their school. Some children were saved, but others 
Uh, but for others, being buried alive, perhaps for days, was the finale of their earthly existence. Similar horrors have resulted from mudslides and hurricanes. Children also face the vicissitudes of nature through disease. I read recently of a couple who learned that their seven-year-old daughter had an incurable genetic disorder that would progressively deteriorate her brain until she ended up in a vegetative state. The horror unfolded slowly over the years after the diagnosis. The parents watched as their daughter wasted away, suffering as she did. If that wasn't bad enough, there was another level of horror to the story. The disease was hereditary. And the couple also had two younger children, twins, who were born a year before the diagnosis of their daughter's illness. These children could face the same fate as their older sibling, and at the age of six, each began presenting with the symptoms and eventually went through the same horrendous process of deterioration. All three children destroyed by the parents' genes. The parents ended up completely broken, and let's be honest, who can blame them? Now, certainly these horrific scenes are emotionally provocative, but I want to be clear right now, I don't mention them merely to evoke emotion, though I can't see how they wouldn't. I have no interest in reducing the tragedy of children to a bit of data in a theological exploration or debate. So why do I say them? These events are important to keep in mind because whatever we say in theoretical discussions regarding evil, these are the types of things that people face in life. These stories reveal the evils that certain creatures, including human adults, human children, and non-human animals have faced. And any theodicy, any theodicy should consider these events deeply before declaring confidently that God is exonerated. And I am here reminded of Hans, jo uh, Hans Jonas, a Jewish philosopher whose mother died in a concentration camp in World War II, who claims that theologians today should never say anything about theodicy that they could not repeat in front of survivors of the Holocaust. These evils are one way, uh, I'm sorry, these evils uh, are ones we may not see from the ivory towers of purely uh, logical inquiry. But they ought to press upon us existentially. They call us to remember that when we pray to God, when we worship God, when we call God good, when we declare God exonerated, we can only be speaking about the God who has either allowed or was unable to prevent a three-year-old boy from being tortured for days by his mother because he wouldn't eat his breakfast who either allows or is unable to prevent children being buried alive for days amid the aftermath of natural disasters, who either allows or is unable to prevent diseases that slowly and plain, painfully obliterate the bodies of children. This is the God we're talking about. And as I will argue later, we can say even more. We are not simply talking about a God who permits these things. We are talking about a God who creates a world in which these types of evils are inevitable. I'll get to that. From these considerations, I'm driven to a general question. How does the existence of natural evil impact the way we think about uh, and relate to God? The question takes some troubling forms. Do we have any business worshiping God? To paraphrase and reapply Ivan's complaint, can the goodness of this world or the goodness of the world to come really justify God in the face of the plight of children whose short lives are filled predominantly with suffering? Should we, like Ivan, return our ticket, reject the harmony that is offered in us to us in protest of its enormous cost? Jake, if you could. And here, after what is admittedly too long and depressing an introduction, I arrive at my thesis, which consists of two fundamental claims. First, if the accusation against God is that God either created or facilitated the existence of a world for which particular innocent creatures, including children, would unwillingly and disproportionately bear the inevitable and terrible cost. The evidence suggests that God is guilty. In light of this recognition, I argue that every theodicy should exist in an irresolvable and paradoxical tension with anti-theodicy, the refusal to exonerate God in the face of those victims of God's creation. And this anti-theodicy requires us to be on the side of victims of cosmic history, even when that means not being on the side of God who set this history into motion. Second, 
Worship of God and celebration of God's creation, including our own lives, ought to be balanced with protest against God and lamentation over the deep harms that obtain in our world. Now let me just name the elephant in the room. Yes, I am aware that these claims are audacious. This is not news to me. And they should not be made casually or hastily. And it is my hope that through the rest of this talk, I will convince you that I have not made them in that way. To support my audacious claims, I'm going to do the following. First, for the sake of precision, I develop a nuanced definition of natural evil. Second, because I am looking for evidence regarding natural evil, I turn to the natural sciences to get a clearer picture of how natural evil obtains in the world. Third, I examine some of the more prominent theodicies that respond to natural evil. I maintain that each fails to exonerate God in the face of the charges mentioned above. Excuse me. Fourth, in light of my critiques of those theodicies, I develop my claim regarding God's guilt and how this guilt should elicit a relationship with God that embodies the very sort of ambiguity present in God's creation. And finally, I defend my position. I defend that my position is, perhaps surprisingly, defensible, maybe even preferable, by the very resources of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Easy stuff. Let me start with the definition of evil. In the introduction of his work, to his work, uh, Evil and the God of Love, John Hick writes, quote, The working vocabulary of theodicy, compared to uh, some other branches of theology, is in a state of imprecision. This, in, end quote, this imprecision is due to the definition, or z, definitions, of evil. Hick originally issued this lament in 1966. However, lack of clarity and agreement regarding the definition of evil still remains. You know, for a fun party game, you can have everyone gather around and try to define it. Or maybe not a party game, I don't know. But there is some common ground. Writers in theodicy tend to accept the distinction between moral theology and natural evil. I'm sorry, moral evil and natural evil, which I've already described. Even so, writers are often unclear regarding why moral evil is evil and what constitutes natural evil. To explain, imagine two moral agents with malicious intents are each attempting to carry out an equally horrible crime, such as murder, against innocent persons. In each case, moral agents are freely speak seeking to bring about harm. But imagine that in the first case, the agent fails to commit the crime. And in the second case, however, the agent successfully carries out the crime, thus causing great harm to the victim. So two questions are worth considering here. First, are both events evil? And second, are both events equally evil? On the one hand, it makes little sense to argue that there is no evil present in the first case, attempted murder. To make such an argument would be to remove moral agency from the equation of evil altogether, inasmuch as the presence of a malicious moral agent who is actively seeking to bring about harm does not in itself constitute the presence of evil. That would be weird. But the moral agent in question embodies maliciousness, regardless of whether he is successful in causing physical harm. So it makes sense to say evil obtains. On the other hand, it doesn't seem to make sense to suggest that both events are equally evil. After all, what is it that allows us to identify an evil intent? Is it not the harm that agent desires to bring about? But if what makes the intention evil is the intended outcome, that is, an outcome that at least the agent perceives to be harmful, then it makes sense to include that harmful outcome in the definition of evil itself. Thus, there is greater evil presence in the case in which a harm is visited upon the victim of these malicious moral agents. In this sense, evil can subsist Evil can subsist in the character of the agent as well as in the outcome of the agent's act. One way to explain this point is to develop a third category of evil, physical evil. While moral evil can obtain merely by the malicious will of a moral agent, physical evil only obtains if the harm actually happens. That is, that the agent is successful in murdering the person. In the case of attempted murder, there is moral evil, but at least theoretic, theoretically no physical evil, because no harm is done. In the latter, however, the moral evil of the malicious uh, agent intent remains, but that moral evil leads to harm or physical evil. And so the attempted murder is not as evil as the actual murder, because physical evil obtains in the second one. If this line of thought is promising, which I think it is, 
It allows us to ask, if harm resulting from the actions of moral agents constitutes an evil, then why uh, would not similar or even identical harms resulting from moral agents also constitute an evil? And here we arrive at the category of natural evil. To explain further, in 2005, Hurricane Katrina devastated the Gulf Coast, killing well over 1,000 people, to say nothing of the deaths of non-human creatures. Certainly, if the category of natural evil exists, this deadly phenomenon, at least in part, qualifies. But why does it qualify? Imagine a storm of exponentially greater magnitude than Katrina, with winds reaching over 400 miles per hour, which is almost three times the minimum of a Category 5 hurricane, and terrifying flashes of lightning. Furthermore, whereas Katrina lasted nine days, imagine this storm lasts centuries. And some of you may realize what I'm talking about. I'm describing the storm on Jupiter, which appears as the uh, famous Great Red Spot. Now, if by evil we mean simply the event itself, then the storm on Jupiter may be a greater evil than Katrina. It's bigger, longer, you know, harder, scarier, faster. But that judgment's counterintuitive, right? How can an amoral event which causes no suffering or premature death be more evil than another amoral event, admittedly with exponentially less duration and intensity, that does cause extensive suffering and death. The intuitive suggestion is that amoral events are not evil in and of themselves. Rather, what makes an amoral event evil is its effect. In the case of Katrina, premature death, suffering, dislocation, psychological effects, and so on. In short, natural evil refers to physical evils, harms, resulting from amoral processes. Now, the initial definition requires some further explanation. Right? I could just leave it there, but I think we need to say more. There's two questions in particular we need to think about. First, for whom can a harm obtain? And second, are all harms physical evils? Let me start with the first question. Most people would accept that the premature death or suffering of a human child would qualify as a harm. But what about an elephant calf? a dragonfly nade, an oak sapling, or a blooming annual. Are the death of those evil? John Hick addresses this point, writing, quote, It is a basic question whether events in nature, which do not directly touch mankind, such as the carnage of animal life, in which one species preys upon another, or the death and decay of plants, or the extinction of a star, are to be counted as evil, end quote. Hicks suggests the view that he thinks most people would find amenable. Again, to quote, the organic cycle of non-sentient nature offers no problem to theodicy. Who cares if the plants die? They're just plants. But wherever there is pain, as there appears to be far down through the animal kingdom, there is a prima facie challenge to be met. On this view, natural evil consists in unwelcome experiences brought upon sentient creatures by causes other than man himself, end quote. Thus, in Hicks' view, natural evil entails only those outcomes that harm creatures capable of pain. A suffering elephant calf would qualify, but the interrupted flourishing of a non-sentient organism such as bacteria and plants would not. As a quick side note, I agree with Hick, and I would add premature death and suffering, that I would agree that pain in the animal world constitutes a prima facie challenge for theodicy. And I'm going to keep my focus there on sentient creatures for this talk. However, I am not convinced that no natural evil can befall non-sentient creatures. I consider the term harm to have wider connotation, including aspects like premature death of plant life. Such an understanding of evil extends beyond the human and animal realms and touches upon the transience of all living organisms. But let's be honest, that's crazy talk. So, I'm not going to focus on that here because I don't want to lose you. I may have already, but I don't want to lose anyone else. We still have to ask a question. Are non-human animals really sentient? It is an impossibly high bar to demand incontrovertible proof on this matter. But, the scientific evidence suggests that many animals, including but not limited to mammals and birds, possess the necessary uh, neurological framework to facilitate conscious suffering. In 2012, a prominent international group of cognitive neuroscientists, neuropharmacologists, neurophysiologists, uh, oh gosh, neurophysiologists, neuroanatomists, and con uh, computational neuroscientists, I will never say that again, 
gathered together at the University of Cambridge to discuss the issue of consciousness. So basically a lot of really smart people who know neuroscience. The gathering led to the promulgation of what's called the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness, in which all the neuroscientists collectively declare, and I quote, the absence of a neocortex does not appear to preclude an organism from experiencing affective states. Convergent evidence indicates that non-human animals uh, have the neuroanatomical, neurochemical, and neurophysiological substrates of conscious states along with the capacity to exhibit intentional behaviors. Consequently, the weight of evidence, which is what science deals with, indicates that humans are not unique in possessing the neurological substrate that generates consciousness. Non-human animals, including all mammals and birds, and many other creatures, including octopuses. I like how they just threw that randomly in there at the end. Shout out to my octopus friends. Uh, but they also include these neurological substrates. This declaration presents a very broad umbrella of human consciousness that goes down, way down the, uh, the mammal, bird, even into other forms of life. Earlier studies, for instance, around 2005, that focused more on common neuroanatomical structures in the human and non-human brain, generally agreed that at least mammals were conscious. They were more suspicious of birds. But that was an earlier study. Furthermore, the work of scientists who study animal behavior and mind, such as Mark Beckhoff, uh, maintain that the evidence, uh, maintain that the evidence certain non-human animals uh, experience pain and conscious suffering is near incontrovertible. We should acknowledge, of course, that not all scientists agree with these claims. Marion uh, uh, Stump Dawkins, for example, remains definitively agnostic on the matter of animal consciousness. Still, from the claims, many uh, from the claims we have, uh, from these claims, we may accept, at least in the eyes of many experts, the evidence regarding consciousness and suffering that suggests that uh, these biological phenomena extect, extend well into the non-human world, including mammals and possibly all vertebrates. It is not difficult to see how this information creates a unique problem for theodicies. Consciousness exists way before we get here, and so does suffering. So what about, so who can, who can be harmed? Well, it turns out a lot of creatures can be harmed. What about uh, the question regarding whether all harm constitutes an evil? After all, not all harms are, all things considered, bad for the creature who experiences them. Not all pain stymies flourishing. For example, it would be really odd, I think, to say that the common pain people experience during and after an invigorating workout is evil. Many joggers consider delay onset muscle soreness a positive outcome, even though it may include some unpleasantness. In fact, physical therapists may refer to such soreness as, quote unquote, good pain. Furthermore, this pain is of value in as much as it conveys to the one who's exercising, you probably ought to think about stopping soon. Um, and that's why I like that I get that very early when I'm jogging, because my body, I'm like, yeah, gotta listen to your body. All right, half a mile, time to go have a pizza. <clears throat> but the point here is that certain harms correspond to values of self-preservation, self-improvement, and even enjoyment. Such pain is conducive to, and in fact necessary for, the flourishing of the creatures who experience it. Indeed, if a complex creature could not feel pain, she would be at a great disadvantage in the evolutionary narrative. Hence, cognitive insensitivity to pain, or CIP, is a very serious and often fatal condition. Therefore, I think it's, we should say, not all harms are evil. And, uh, and not all harms are unambiguously evil. But not all pain is good in the sense I just described. Imagine a disease in which a child experiences a pain biologically similar to the pain of a runner who jogs for sport or leisure. In such a case, the pain is similar, but its functional value fails to obtain for the child. Right? The child is unwilling, it doesn't help the child learn anything, and once the disease is recognized, it has no helpful value to the child. But if it's incurable, the disease, the pain itself is inescapable, right? It has no vital importance, but you can't get rid of it. From these considerations, we can begin to develop a home definition of natural evil. Here we go for the next one. When an individual creature experiences a harm that he or she does not choose, cannot escape, and does not benefit from, the harm constitutes a physical evil. And similar to, again, Adam's category of horrendous evils, but broader, 
Uh, the intensity of these evils increases to the extent that the harm cripples or extinguishes the flourishing of the individual creature experiencing them. When these kinds of harms, these physical evils, result or originate from amoral sources, they are natural evils. So a natural evil is then any harm that meets the criteria of the creature. The individual creature cannot escape, does not benefit, uh, and it does not uh, and, and cannot uh, does not choose. Now, to be clear, not all theologians would accept my definition of natural evil, but they're wrong. No, I'm <laughs> uh, David Ray Griffin defines, for instance, a genuine evil as "quote unquote" anything, all things considered, uh, without which the universe would not ha would have been better. So, for Griffin, evils are only genuine if the de if there is a detriment to the whole, not just the individual. So whereas Adams defines horrendous evils as those which render the life of an individual, not the whole, not good, Griffin will, will focus on the holistic state of the cosmos, right? And this one deer dies in a forest fire, the cosmos muddles through, no harm, no, you know, no big foul, so that wouldn't count. But I don't find Gr Griffin's idea very helpful, uh, because at least in my reading, it, it, it envisions God as decidedly unconcerned for the plight of individual creatures. For my part, I maintain that a singular event can have a differentiated outcome for various creatures, with neither outcome being subsumed into the other. For example, the act of predation may be symbiotic at the species level, as Holmes Rolston III has quipped. The cougar's fang has carved the limbs of the fleet-footed deer. And likewise, the fleet-footed deer has cut the teeth of the cougar. A rising tide raises all ships, or cougars, and Deer, whatever. That's how the saying goes. But we need to be clear, not all ships are raised here. In the individual act of predation, either the predator or the prey loses. If the prey loses, she dies, often in rather painful ways. If the predator loses, she goes hungry, which could also lead to an excruciating death, starvation. In a similar manner, the bacteria feeding on the denigrating body of an infant, an infant actually experiences parasitism as positive, right? It's good and essential to the flourishing of the bacteria. But the child experiences it as an evil, absolutely devastating to, the, to flourishing. It follows that occurrences which serve as good to some individuals, and maybe even good at more holistic levels, are experienced as negative, indeed evil, for many individual creatures. Uh, non-human and human alike, whose flourishing they frustrate and or terminate. terminate. In other words, a good day for the predator is a bad day for its victim. Okay? Thinking of Arnold Schwarzenegger here. No? Okay, fine. Get to the chopper. Anyway, uh, a good day for certain parasites is a bad day for their hosts. A good day for the Earth's atmosphere spells disaster for some creatures breathing its oxygen. <coughs> The world, and this is important, the world is such that it cannot end happily for all life forms. There has to be losers. Now because, in my view, uh, because my view of evil is more in line with that of Adams than with that of Griffin, I do not reduce genuine evils to only those harms that do not result in a greater holistic good. A sentient creature suffers genuine evils when she experiences harm such that her individual life is no longer all things considered good for her. Think of Job here. It would be better if I did not exist. That's an evil. It follows that a number of phenomena qualify as phenomena, I'm sorry, qualify as natural evils. Uh, the prey being torn apart by the predator is a natural evil. The human riddled with cancer experience is a natural evil. The child burned, buried alive in the rubble of an earthquake or a, or a, a hurricane is the victim of a natural evil. These evils may bring about good on holistic levels and for some other creatures, but it does not follow that the evils incurred by the individual creatures are therefore meaningless or good. Before moving on, I just want to make one quick comment. Today, it's very difficult to differentiate between natural evil and moral evil. The, the lines are blurry. They come together. Um, there, are, there are places, a friend of mine, a Vietnamese friend of mine, told me that they had to invent new words in Vietnam in the wake of Agent Orange for diseases. Uh, so we have created and exacerbated diseases, and we are causing a lot of bad things through you know, uh, climate change and other things like that. 
But I still think it makes sense to differentiate between natural and moral evil. All that said, we are now better situated to examine the theodicies uh, that account for natural evils. But before doing that, let's talk about science, because I think we need to talk about science. I'm not a scientist, but I like to sound smart. Theodicy is not about the existence of God. We can jump ahead here. Theodicy is not about the existence of God, at least not just any old God. It's rather about the existence of a particular God. Theodicy, as its etymology suggests, raises the question of the righteousness or justice, that is, from the Greek dike, of God, from the Greek theos, in the face of the reality creatures experience in the world. The question is not about the existence of God per se, but about the existence of a God who fits a rather, you know, very particular personal ad. Single God, perfectly good and powerful, seeking good world with which to commune. I respond. On the surface, theodicy seems to be only, to be, uh, only or at least primarily a theological and or philosophical endeavor. And certainly because theodicy deals fundamentally with God, it is a theological endeavor. Furthermore, because it addresses God's nature and meta-ethical questions such as good, evil, justice, theodicy is also philosophical. But because theodicy necessarily asks all these questions in light of creaturely existence in this cosmos, it also necessarily requires a scientific component. We simply cannot examine God's justice vis-a-vis -vis the cosmos if we don't have an adequate understanding of the cosmos. It follows that science provides a necessary raw material in the construction of a theodicy, and that any theodicy that does not take account of this material will be suspect, inasmuch as it claims to address God's justice in light of creaturely existence in the cosmos, but doesn't really seem concerned with the disciplines that present that picture to us, what the cosmos looks like. Now, this isn't to say that you have to have an advanced degree in science to do theodicy, but it is to say that if you're going to do theodicy, you should probably pay attention to what people with advanced degrees are saying, right? For moral evil, we might pay attention to the social sciences, uh, and including the neurosciences as well. But for natural evil, we need to pay attention to the, the so-called natural sciences, especially cosmology and biology. Now, since my focus is natural evil, I want to draw out uh, four important claims that the natural sciences affirm that I think every theodicy has to account for. First, the cosmic narrative. Given evidence from cosmology and geology, this particular cosmos of which we are a part appears to be just shy of 14 billion years old. Big birthday coming up around the corner. <laughs> Planet Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. The evolution of the cosmos began with an initial event, often depicted as a quote-unquote Big Bang, which resulted in a particular order. Here we mean fundamental forces and constants. And these or this order provides a law-like regularity that makes cosmic evolution and eventually biological evolution possible. Leaving aside the question of intelligent design, it is true that this universe appears to be finely tuned for life as we know it. If the constants change, life would not be possible. If the gravitational force were weaker or stronger, we wouldn't have time for plants to, planets to form. But in a long story made short, the first elements of the universe, mainly hydrogen and helium in a particular balance, eventually form gaseous stars, which, turn, uh, which in turn become furnaces that forge heavier elements, and in going supernova, distribute these elements across the universe. These heavier elements uh, make uh, future generations of stars possible, around which planets such as Earth are able to take shape. And these elements forged in the stars and Earth's processes also make life possible. So as Carl uh, Sagan uh, famously put it, humans and all our creaturely kin are made of the stuff of stars. This is the stardust idea. And as really the mythic imagery of Genesis so astutely uh, states, Adam, that is the human creature, is made from the Adama, that is the earth. Second, the biological narrative. On at least one planet, maybe more, we don't know. We know that Pope Francis would baptize them if they were, but, but at least on one planet, Life comes into being, and it's a rather mysterious event. The emergence of life begins a battle of perseverance against the constant pull of entropy. As Charles, Darwin's helped de Charles Darwin helped demonstrate, life develops through a meandering process of random genetic mutations, depending on environmental surroundings, that give creatures either advantages or disadvantages in their world. Advantage advantageous mutations that facilitate survival in a particular environment uh, tend to be passed on because the surviving creatures get to procreate. And then those, you know, those, uh, those children, those creatures, get their, their genes from their parents. And those creatures with maladaptations 
uh, that make survival less likely in a given environment tend to die off in competition, in competition for scarce resources. Or if they're predator seeking prey, scared resources. Either way it works. But boom. boom. Yeah. Uh, but a caveat is necessary here. Charles Darwin recognized that his theory of evolution relied at least in part on the competitive clash between individual creatures. Uh, indeed, it was this recognition that led Darwin to doubt and possibly renounce the existence of God. But more recently, neo-Darwinian views have helped balance the bloodier side of evolution with aspects such as cooperation and symbiosis. That sounds much better. But it would be a grave error to suggest that these cooperative de uh, dimensions have replaced the competitive ones. As Sarah Copley notes, quote, there is no less suffering or wastage in a cooperative vision of evolutionary emergence than in a merely competitive one. So yes, there is symbiosis, yes, there's cooperation, but there still is waste and there still is suffering. The life process is a violent and wasteful one. Point number two, that's a good bumper sticker. Third, the package deal narrative. Nancy Murphy, uh, among others, argue that suffering, along with other harmful concomitants of the evolutionary narrative, are quote-unquote unavoidable byproducts of the conditions in the natural world that have to obtain in order for there to be intelligent life at all. Similar claims are made by a number of scientifically informed theologians. Christopher Southgate, John Polkinghorne, Arthur Peacock, Holmes Rolston III, John Cobb, Robert John Russell, Celia Dean Drummond, Elizabeth Johnson, and Patricia Williams. That's the academic version of name dropping. <laughs> These authors all maintain that creation as we know it is a package deal of values, life, sentience, biodiversity, and disvalues, death, suffering, predation. In other words, the particular law-like regularity of this cosmos in which we live and the mechanisms entailed by biological evolution are such that you cannot have life without death. You cannot have biodiversity and complexity without predation. You cannot have biodiversity without disease. You get one, you get the other. And predation provides a good example. In 2009, a study that relied upon computer-generated models taking account for basic physical uh, and biological principles, conservation of uh, energy and matter, inheritance, predation, advantage, this study suggested that predation, in this case, uh, phagocytic predation, in which cells eat other cells, uh, cell on cell violence, I don't know, uh, began extremely early in the narrative of life. Why did predation begin so early? Well, David Penny, one of the scientists responsible for the study, said, the principles of biology made predation inevitable. It's just too advantageous a strategy. And that goes also with parasitism. So, things like predation are inevitable given the very structure of our cosmos, the biological principles of our cosmos. It is virtually inconceivable that a particular world we inhabit could be otherwise. Fourth, the continuity narrative. Humans have come into being through this cosmological and biological narrative. While there are some who advocate for the special creation of humans, of God, humans by God breaking into creation, disrupting the evolutionary narrative, we should note that the evolutionary narrative is fully capable of providing an explanation for the existence of humans. When we say that humans are made of star stuff, we are saying that humans are not aliens in the cosmos. We are quite at home here. And even this is too extrinsic. We are not merely at home in the cosmos. We are the cosmos. I was going to have a slide here with the We Are the World gang singing, but uh, I figured not everyone would get that. We are part of the world. We are furthermore acknowledging a close kinship with other creatures in as much we are all, we are all part of the same family tree, the tree of life. We have some weird relatives, but that happens. And someday down the road, they're going to look back at us and say, wow, that was a weird tangent. <laughs> the, continuity, the continuity narrative is important for two reasons. First, it reminds us that we are not so essentially unique as to be able to regard the plight of other creatures as meaningless. We're all facing the same struggles. Because I've already touched on this with the question of consciousness and neuroscientists, I don't need to develop this point here further, so I'll jump to the second point. The continuity narrative reveals that without the negative aspects of the cosmos, humans wouldn't exist at all. The extinction of dinosaurs, for example, love, uh, that extinction gave mammals the space to evolve toward complexity of primates. It wouldn't have worked if we had to constantly hide from dinosaurs trying to eat us. Yeah? Just watch Jurassic Park. It doesn't go well for anybody except the dinosaurs. 
Generally speaking, life has made, uh, death has made our lives possible. It is in this vein that Elizabeth Johnson writes, quote, Those who live today walk upon earth as a vast cemetery. That's pleasant. Let's make it more unpleasant. Uh, humans don't merely walk upon a cemetery. Inasmuch as the elements that make up your body were passed on to you through other creatures who have died, you don't just walk on a cemetery, you are a cemetery. <laughs> I gotta go take a shower. <laughs> Excuse me for a minute. We are all mausoleum of previous creatures. Now, let's simplify these four, four points. Put it on a bumper sticker. First, the cosmos is extremely old. Could have just said that and been done with it, but it is. Second, life has developed through a meandering evolutionary process that involves random genetic mutations, some of which are harmful. Third, the very structure of our cosmos renders natural evils such as disease, predation, and extinction inevitable and or necessary. They are a package deal with the goods we experience. Fourth, it is this narrative, full of violence though it is, that has given rise to myriad creatures, including humans. With our creaturely kin, we face the vicissitudes of existence. Some lose, some win, and in both the winning and the losing, life develops. Now, I may go without saying that these four realities present some difficulties for theodicy. Consider, phenomenon such, a phenomenon such as phagocytic predation, the Cambrian uh, mass extinction, bone cancer in dinosaurs, none of these could have originated with human sin. They are all natural outcomes of the order of the universe. Entropy is part of the law-like regularity of the cosmos, and here we begin to see the issue. If God has fine-tuned the universe for life, God has also finally tuned the universe for violence, extinction, and disease. Even more potently, ours is a universe that is extremely well designed for the suffering and death of children. Don't believe me, go to an old cemetery and look at the vast majority of headstones. Thus the problem in a nutshell. How does the Christian claim that a good God creates a good creation? How does that claim account for the ubiquity of these negative aspects when these aspects are necessary and or inevitable given the very structure of that creation. What do we make of the notion that God created a world so well equipped for extinction that 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed are now extinct? Or that God created a world with parameters in which biological strategies such as predation and parasitism are so rewarding they're virtually inevitable? That in God's good creation, life develops through a process of random genetic mutation that inevitably leads to maladaptations such as cancer. If there is a critical blow to cosmo that cosmological and biological evolution delivers to Christian faith, it is not about the age of the earth or the ancestry of humans. It is rather about the character of a God who would create such a world that facilitates such violence on such unthinkable scales. So how should we respond? Well, you know, people are like to write books. So there's a number of responses to this scientifically informed problem. Now, I'm not going to go into depth because, let's be honest, you know, you're waning and so am I. Need a drink of tea? Woo. But I do want to talk about some of them just to sort of explain why I don't think they work. Some proposals. Got to drink. Some proposals seek to exonerate God by arguing that God is not to blame for the existence of natural evils. Rather, these evils originate and persist because God created moral agents that misuse their freedom. This view was very important to early Christians such, the, such as Theophilus of Antioch, Irenaeus of Lyon, and even Augustine, who maintained that a historical human fall warped nature and thereby disrupted the original harmony of all creatures. But as I've already pointed out, we can't say this anymore because it flies as starkly as you can in the face of all the evidence that cosmology and geology gives us. Intelligent design advocate William Dempsey, however, has attempted in a rather curious manner to recover the position that all harms trace back to a human fall. In Dempsey's view, God experiences all time in an eternal now. Okay, we can accept this, maybe. And because God experiences time as such, God is able to create a world riddled with natural evils as a retroactive response to and in preparation of the human fall. So humans fall in the future, but because God is timeless, God is like, yeah, that happened. Now let me go back to the past and create the world that's all messed up. Got you, humans. 
And for Dembski, humans, God did all of this to educate humans about the severity of our sin. So like, you know, Cambrian extinction, it's really bad when you lie. <laughs> really bad. Now, for Dembski, hum, for Dembski, humans are thus to blame for all natural evils. Okay, so this theodicy is problematic. First, Dembski maintains that to retroactive effects of the fall, for example, extinction and predation, are exactly... Uh, or humans cause that. But those exact effects are exactly what enable humans to evolve to a point where they can fall and thereby cause the retroactive effects of the fall. If the, animal, if the dinosaur didn't go extinct, humans wouldn't be here and they couldn't fall. It's weird, right? Now, Doc Brown and Marty McFly might be willing to accept such temporal paradoxes. If you, ha if you don't get that joke, I pity you. Another example of evil in our world. Uh, but it does seem to me like Dembski is just basically offering an ad hoc response in order to, pre to preserve the justice of God. But also, aside from the problematic nature of that, Dembski's theodicy is kind of horrific. It's an egregious combination of anthropocentrism and injustice. God wills the extinction of 99% of all species of, on the planet prior to the appearance of humans in order to educate humans that sin is bad. Just seems like overkill to me, right? And also, it's like we don't even know about most of it. So it'd be like if I was trying to educate my son and like went in the back room and strangled a dog. And they'd be like, why'd you do that? I'm trying to let my son know about sin. But he didn't even know you were doing it. That's how much I love him. Wouldn't make any sense. Anyway, most people have acknowledged that Dembski's view doesn't work. So Gregory Boyd has offered a different approach, and I think it's better. He develops what's called a cosmic warfare theodicy in which he argues that the law-like regularity of the cosmos as it currently exists uh, including features such as entropy, uh, all of that occurs because fallen angels led by Lucifer tampered with God's original creation. So the devil really is to blame. Boyd's theodicy rests upon a number of premises. In order to create a world in which genuinely free creatures could exist, God had to limit God's own power by engaging in what he calls a covenant of non-coercion with those creatures, a guarantee that God will not, at least for a certain amount of time, interfere with their freedom. Because God granted angels, especially Lucifer, an immense amount of power and responsibility, angelic disobedience results in greater damage than human disobedience. Sure, humans can harm one another, but angels have the power to reorder the entire cosmos. And because God made a covenant of non-coercion with these angels, God can't interfere with that, them doing that. So angels are to blame for entropy, not God. A couple problems here. First... Dempsey fa I mean, sorry, uh, Boyd fails to delineate a causal link between angelic fall and restructuring the cosmos. It's unclear exactly how the angels are able to do this, but they are. Second, the proposal is kind of Manichaean slash Gnostic because it makes the physical world created by evil creatures, right? Think about this. If malicious angel angelic powers work the laws of nature... Uh, and that those laws of nature produce disvalues, and those disvalues are what make human life possible, we have to then suggest that we exist not because God created us, but because angels disobeyed. We are the child of demons. And that's just not going to work for people, right? You can't put that on a bumper sticker. Also, Boyd doesn't really know how to deal with miracles. Why does God sometimes intervene and not, you know, if there's a covenant of non-coercion? And Boyd says, well, that's because God makes a covenant of coercion with each creature individually, and so it's different for each creature. But that's the very definition of the logical fallacy of special pleading. Other proposals accept that God is responsible for natural evils. They maintain that God is not indictable because these natural evils were the only way for God to create the kind of world in which we live here. I'm going to skip ahead. I have some stuff here, but I, I, I want to keep moving so we can get to Q&A. The point being that they all maintain that God has somehow suggested, created this world because it's the only way to create a greater good. All of these views are going to agree on two points. First, God and not humans are responsible for the order of the cosmos. God created this world, ex nihilo, out of nothing in most cases, and therefore, God is responsible for the order of the world. So why did God create this world? It was that sort of it lends itself to such natural evils. Well, the answer is, it's the only world that could bring about morality, creaturely freedom, things like that. The second point of agreement is that the goods that result from our particular cosmos outweigh the evils that result from it. It's all good because in the end, more good than bad exists. Sort of standard utilitarian thinking here. Therefore, God is justified in creating worlds such as ours, even though it facilitates 
such tremendous harms. I don't think this view works. Um, first, because it doesn't clear God of the charge of actually creating a world in which these creatures will suffer and die. It's also unclear why this is the only way God could do this. We can imagine God creating a world just like this, ex nihilo, and there would be biodiversity, order, complexity, autonomy, but you wouldn't have billions of years of evolutionary development with creatures suffering and dying. There's nothing logical that says God couldn't have done that, but that means God chose this meandering evolutionary route unnecessarily, and that would be a problem. Um, once we're here, maybe some, some disvalues are necessary in order for us to develop morality, but it's not necessary for us to get here. In other words, if God's goal was moral creatures or biodiversity or intelligent life, there's no logical reason God could not have accomplished this goal with much less suffering. Second, as I mentioned, it does nothing to uh, get God off the hook for creating a world in which innocent creatures, including children, would unwillingly and disproportionately bear the inevitable and terrible cost. God remains guilty of this charge. And third, while each, attempt, uh, each approach attempts to justify God's decision to create such a world, we must continue to acknowledge that this decision is always made on behalf of other creatures, and is always made by people who have survived and done well in the world. We might call that survivor's privilege. I don't know that we're all qualified to speak on behalf of the creatures who have died horrible lives and say, yeah, it was all worth it. Seems kind of strange. Now, there's another way, there's another view that Warren's mentioned here, and it's process theology, but I'm actually going to skip ahead and, and skip that. I'll just say that process theology basically is a way of saying God is not, God, we, God is not able to stop evil because God has to work non-coercively in the world. And it, but that pro, it's going to run into the same problem because the world that God lures into existence is a world in which natural evil still inevitably attained. And God cannot guarantee a victory over these evils. So God still throws all these creatures into evil, but cannot guarantee their salvation in the end. So in some senses, it's actually worse. Now, there's other proposals that are worth exploring too, but I think I've mentioned enough to give a general idea of maybe why they don't work. So let's move to the last part if we can. I've argued that none of the theodicies on the table exonerate God fully in the face of the existence and perseverance of evil. While some theodicies, suggest a cosmolog some theodicies suggest, for instance, an eschatology where everyone's going to be saved and all creatures are going to participate in God's life, others can't guarantee that outcome. But even with the eschatological caveat, there is still the question as to whether eschatological harmony is worth the types of suffering that we encounter. Again, back to Ivan uh, Karamazov's que uh, question, is the price too high? At any rate, attempts to suggest that God is not responsible for the order of creation blaming demons and humans, are unconvincing in the face of the picture science presents to us regarding the order of the cosmos. The idea that somehow humans or demons could have disrupted the world such that entropy is now law really strains credulity and doesn't make a lot of sense. Any claim that God created this world has to bear the brunt of the acknowledgement that God therefore created a world in which these kinds of harm would inevitably attain for creatures. And so, um, and then that none of that even asks the question of why God does not intervene more to stop them from happening. That's a whole other conversation that's worth having. So, I want to return all that said to my original claims. If the accusation against God is that God either created or facilitated the existence of a world, for which particular innocent creatures, including children, would unwillingly and disproportionately bear the inevitable costs. The evidence suggests, in my opinion, that God is in fact guilty. God created this world, and this world inevitably leads to natural evils. This claim leads me to the validity of anti-theodicy. We may seek to soften the problem of evil by developing theodicies, but in my opinion, we should always balance those theodicies with anti-theodicies. Right? We, should punt, we should refuse to exonerate God in the face of the evidence about God's guilt. We should not pretend that we have succeeded in exonerating God in the face of the countless victims of God's creation. We should rather firmly stand on the side of those victims protesting the cost they have been forced to pay. Second, worship of God and celebration of God's good creation should be balanced with protest and lamentation over the deep harms that experience in this world. The world is not unambiguously good. 
Indeed, some creatures, to some creatures, the world may appear more unambiguously harmful or evil. So why don't we allow these kind of conversations to happen in church? The last thing that I want to say, and I know I'm sort of skipping here a little bit. Uh, uh, one more. Here's where I want to try to convince you that it's okay to say what I'm saying. Because I want to still have a job at some point. When I say things like God is guilty and we should protest against God, the typical response I get from Christians is, no, you cannot say that. Christians cannot protest against God. They cannot accuse God. They cannot doubt God. They cannot lament God's creation. My answer is, I don't think that's correct. Consider, when Abraham learned that God was going to destroy Sodom, he began to debate with God over whether or not this should happen. And ends up asking of God, imagine the audacity of this, will not the judge of the universe do what is just? When Moses is delivering the Israelites from Egypt, at one point he goes before God and says, you are no better than Pharaoh. That's a pretty strong accusation, right? Because if you remember, Pharaoh was not kind of cool. Then, when he takes the people outside and God is going to destroy them for building the golden calf, Moses says, no, don't do that. You shouldn't do that. That's the wrong decision to make. And here's the crazy thing. God actually ends up agreeing. Moses wins the debate with God. Imagine if Moses had said, yeah, it's not really okay to question God. A lot of people would have died that day. The Psalms present... Psalm 44, for example, present a lot of accusations against God where Israel accuses God of being unfaithful to the covenant and very clearly says, this is not our fault, this is your fault. The book of Lamentations, that's right, there's a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations where people are saying, God, this is terrible. Why won't you help us? Why won't you rescue us? <clears throat> and if none of that is convincing, I would like you to consider this. Jesus Christ God incarnate, when I'm ready to bring out the big guns now. I don't know if you can refer to Jesus as a big gun, but that's okay. The idea that Jesus is God incarnate, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity incarnate, is born on this earth. When he encounters the death of Lazarus, he weeps. And when he's hanging on the cross, he says something very, very interesting. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Just think about that for a second. What is Jesus doing there? He's accusing God of forsaking him. But he is God. It's a weird thing going on here, right? But when God experienced the horrors of this world, even God accused God. Let that sink in for a moment. Even God accused God. And if God accused God, it follows that an accusation against God is now sanctified. It is a godly way to be. And that means we should have liturgical outlets where people can say, God, you are guilty. You have forsaken me. Rouse yourself, O Lord. Why do you let shooters get away with these mass murders? Rouse yourself, O God. Why do you allow children to be buried under avalanches and earthquakes? Why do you let children die of disease, O God? We shouldn't be terrified to say these things because when we say these things, when we put ourselves on the side of victims, we find ourselves ironically and paradoxically on the side of God, even as we are against God because Jesus accused God of divine forsakenness. My point here is to say we do not have two choices here. Praise God or refuse to talk to God at all. There's a third option. When I go home tomorrow and I fly home, I'm going to meet my four-year-old son at the airport. And I hope, you know, he's not going to be like, hey, Dad, so. I hope he's going to run up to me and he's going to give me a big hug and he's going to say, Daddy! And it's going to melt my heart. And I'm, in that moment, I'm going to have absolute and extreme bliss. But you know what else? I can't forget that there are other parents who will never get to hug their children, at least not in this life. They're they would give anything to do it they're not going to get to. And that is an inevitable outcome of this world. I can celebrate my own life and lament its cost. I can praise God for creating and redeeming us and accuse God of forsaking us in the moment of our darkest needs, right? of our darkest hours and deepest needs. There is no contradiction here. Well, no, no, there is a contradiction, but it's a contradiction we need to embody. 
because it's a contradiction that Jesus himself embodied when he accused God of forsaking him. Thank you. So uh, we have time for Q and A, which I'm really nervous about, but I think it's, um, no, that's not going to do it. Oops. So if anyone has any questions, feel free. I don't know if you want to try to facilitate this or. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously it would look different in different liturgical traditions. Yeah. You know, so that would be the first thing. But one thing I think, you know, we don't have to invent them. They already exist. What about a corporate reading of Psalm 44 after a national tragedy, right? Or after something terrible has happened, where there is accusation against God and it's never settled. What about readings from Lamentations, right? Um, Lent is the only time we're allowed to be depressed in church, which is crazy because a lot of bad stuff happens outside of Lent. But you're not even allowed to be depressed about, like, God. You have to be depressed about your own sin. Which is kind of weird, right? Um, I think we need to reformulate some of those ideas. The world is currently living not only an Easter Sunday, but Good Friday and a hellish Saturday. And we need to be able to embody that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the one side with Easter Sunday? Exactly how that would look would depend on the liturgical services. But we have these resources in our tradition. Let's read a psalm together. There's plenty out there. Let's read Lamentations together. But I also think pastors and priests need to stop preaching. No, not everyone does this. need to stop preaching as if you are not allowed to be upset about tragedies that happen. As if you're not allowed to accuse God. I just don't see how that's justifiable from the Christian tradition. Um, I want to hit on the last part where you said God um, punishes himself with Jesus. Mm -hmm. My God, my God. Now, from what I read, if we look into Psalm 22, mm -hmm. if you read the whole thing, it's actually yeah. a hope. Yeah. So is it really uh, one of saying, like, you know, my God, why am I going more just knowing that, yeah, we might be able to question God, but yeah, there's hope. Right. No, I think it's a great point. Um, Psalm 22 itself makes the point I'm trying to make, that you don't have to choose between the two. It's not all hope or, and no protestation. It's not all protestation and no hope. It's both. That you can say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet I put my hope in you. You know, Elie Wiesel tells a story about uh, Talmudic scholars in Holocaust in Auschwitz. And the Talmudic scholars actually put God on trial for violating the covenant. And at the end of the trial, they actually found God guilty. It's a crazy story. And they say God is guilty. They declare it, these Talmudic scholars. And then uh, Wiesel says, nobody spoke for like ever. And then, one of the Talmudic scholars says, it's time to pray. Think about that. They declared God guilty and then they prayed to God. They put their hope in God. My, my concern is that we look at Psalm 22 and say, look, it ends in hope. Therefore, let's completely disregard the protest. See, because you're only allowed really to hope. And I think we need to say, no, 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 no. Jesus was really asking this question. Yes, his hope was in God still, but he did make this accusation against God. Let's, let's allow that to exist in tension, right? Let's not try to sort of purify the protests. Does that kind of speak to it a little bit? Yeah. Somebody over here. Um, I just had a question. So, like in regards to the Trinity mm -hmm. and like the concept of the Holy Spirit and how it's like God's presence inside of us and like leading us to do good things, how would you like argue the fact like that some people believe that we're supposed to be the ones going and doing the good things, not God? <clears throat> Yeah, I think there's a sense in which, you know, the notion of being co-creators with God and the idea of saying, you know, I'm not, I'm not certainly not suggesting that we sit around and say, God, you should go do this stuff, you know. Um, but there, and, and we are, we're out there digging in rubble trying to rescue children from being buried alive. I don't think the two, it's one or the other. I think we should, I mean, I think protest, I said, theodicy and anti-theodicy should be in tension, but I also think we should always be in protest theodicy which is once we identify what we perceive to be as evil, we ought to work against it in the world, right? It's 
It's one of the reasons why, for instance, I'm a vegetarian. It's a protest. Um, it's one of the reasons why I think you know, we should try to cure cancer, even though cancer is very natural. Right? It's part of the evolutionary narrative. Um, I think we can do both. We can say, God, you know, we want to be out there doing the work, but I think we should also be saying, but, you know, you want to, you want to come with? You know, maybe and like help us out. So I think, again, that, that both are necessary. But I think also the point about the spirit, that this is another place where we can sense the tension. Uh, Romans 8, where Paul does his whole sort of spirit discussion, is a very interesting thing, because Paul says, when we pray, we pray with groans that words cannot express. And then he goes on to say, all creation is groaning, right? Uh, and then he goes on to say uh, that we also groan. But this groaning is a very interesting point because it's the th only thing in the text that is true of God, I'm sorry, true of the spirit of God, the humans, and the entire non-human creation. So I think the spirit is involved in God's feeling of creation as well, and sort of feeling of that, and that encourages us and moves us. But the spirit of God also groans in lament over the way the world is. Um, and so I think, you know, we can consider those kinds of thoughts. We're all groaning together. But at the same time, I do think then there's a, there's a point to be said, God, you know, why can't you do more, right? So there's that tension that exists still there. But I do think someone who sits around and says, God, you're not doing anything, so I don't care. Yeah, that, that would be a problem, right? Because then you're just saying, you're no better. <laughs> and you lose the sort of, the high ground. Can you have more high ground on God? Probably not. I'm going to go back to kind of the beginning of your talk, um, and you brought up an example of a natural evil uh, in a mudslide. Yeah. And for me, that brought up an interesting point. Is there a fourth kind of evil that is based on human ignorance? Yeah. And if that's an evil, is or could it be defined either as a moral evil or a natural evil in, its, in and of itself? That the builders built in yeah. the wrong place because they were ignorant of what could happen. Yeah, this is an astute observation. So um, in the book that I'm working on, I have two chapters on evil, and each one's like 8,000 words, and so I'm trying to define it. So I kind of summarize a lot here. But one of the things I say about moral evil is we can talk about moral evil as malice, or we can talk about moral evil as carelessness. I don't believe when a drunk driver gets in the car, he is doing it maliciously, but he's being careless enough that I think we're talking about a moral failing here. So carelessness um, can also be, ignorance would be tricky, like, they, there's no way they would know any better. That, I would probably say that's closer to moral evil, natural evil, I'm sorry. But the sort of blatant carelessness, yes, I would qualify that under, think about a doctor who, like, you know, tries to save a child, does everything he can, and the child dies. And another doctor in the same case, but is inebriated when he operates. Well, in the first case, no moral evil obtains, but in the second case, it certainly does. So I, I think I would, I would, that's all caught up, but I'll send you the chapter of my book, and then you can send me back notes, and we'll read <laughs> Yeah. No, but it's, it's an astute observation. It really is. Thank you. Jeffrey? Also going back to the, uh, to the beginning of your presentation, you talk about consciousness a little bit. Mm -hmm. You briefly say that um, animals have consciousness because they experience pain. Well, what's, sure. uh, what are you, are you defining what's the relationship between consciousness and personhood and the traditional definition of personhood? Yeah. Uh, so... The, de the definition of personhood is going to take us far afield and into like the complex questions. I don't think we have a consistent good definition of personhood. I think we think we do, but we don't. Because if we say personhood is rationality, as uh, Immanuel Kant said, well then some humans aren't people, right? And we don't want that. We want all humans to be people. So I've challenged students before to give me a definition of personhood that includes an anosynphalic infant, but does not include a chimpanzee. And I can't think of, I don't think there is one. So my, my point there is just to make, I think we have a notion of personhood that is connected to humans that is very inconsistent. We just want to include all humans simply because they're biologically human. But then it's no longer a philosophical category, it's a biological category. And I think that would be problematic. Why is that ethically, morally relevant? That's the first thing I'll say. The second thing I'll say in terms of uh, your question about <laughs> consciousness, I didn't say they're conscious because they experience pain. And what I said was, I follow, I accept the evidence of their consciousness based on these neuroscientific, this neuroscientific data. That for instance, we can actually map what's happening in the human brain when consciousness is at work. And we can see these kind of similar things happening in other creatures, even creatures who lack a, neo, uh, a neocortex, right? So it's not conclusive, I'm not gonna say that it is, 
But the evidence from neuroscience and animal behavior studies and animal mind studies uh, do in fact suggest that consciousness is likely, very likely, in at least, especially higher mammals, probably all the way down through the, uh, the kingdom of vertebrates. Now, if we want to say that that makes them all persons, I'm actually okay with that. Um, my hunch is we don't want to say that, but then we're back to that question of, can we find a definition of person that has that boundary we really want it to have? My hunch is that we cannot. Um, with respect to, uh, I think it was the second of the orator's sort of the odysseys to this, this broad scope sort of problem that you're, you laid out in the course of the talk. Thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, oh, yeah. um, with, with the, what was it, the angelic call, and I think Boyd was yeah. the, the person who decided to reply to that. Um, and I, if I recall correctly, what you said is that, um, that the, the core problem with that attempt at the Odyssey is that it says that our generation, you know, the, the generation of such creatures as us is in fact downstream of the demons, you know, rather than God's self. Um, but I guess, I, how is that different in principle than, for instance, the toddler who was tortured by the mother and her boyfriend? Like, it's still, you know, uh, an abhorrent and, and stomach-churning evil. Um, but I'm not certain that I catch the principal distinction as far as, um, you know, one's, one's suffering and, and the harm to one being downstream of, of another conscious agent. Um, you know, that, that that's sort of uh, an inevitable possibility of their freedom. Yeah, so let me make two comments on this. This is a good, very good, a nice memory, by the way. Yeah, I'm like, well, I don't remember. Let me go back to my notes and see. Uh, no, very good. Um, when, I, when I was, the downstream statement, what I meant to say was that if if the demons created this order of the world, then they are our creators, because we wouldn't exist without them. That's the only point I was trying to make. So when we say that, for instance, Nicene Creed, that God is the creator of all things seen and unseen, well, no, demons kind of created the laws of the cosmos. And that, and without those laws, we wouldn't even be here as we know, as life as we know it right now. And that's, a, that's, that's kind of a problem, right? Because it does sound like you know, some evil God created this material world and we need to escape back to the immaterial world, which is the Gnostic point of it. To your question about is it any different than the child, the, the child being tortured, um, being downstream? Um, <clears throat> no, I don't know that it is, and that's the whole problem, isn't it? Um, I, I don't think, if I'm understanding your question right, I, I don't think that any of that information would exonerate God, right? Um, we are still, if, if Boyd is correct, God would be exonerated in as much as God didn't create this order, right? The demons did. And so God's not responsible for all the evil that comes out of this order, except for the fact that God didn't stop them from doing it, which is kind of like a, I don't know why you wouldn't do, stop them from doing it. Um, so in that sense, it, it's sort of meaningful because God didn't create the order of the world that renders natural evils inevitable. Demons did. Does that make sense? Am I answering your question or do you follow up with me? I, I think so. I mean, it's... Um but I mean, part of the, the matter of, uh, or the uh, theology of moral evil is that, um, you know, that it's sort of imperative on God, or I, well, that's probably not the way that one wants to put it ultimately, um, but <laughs> um, that, you know, that, that God in creating humans um, gave a certain capacity for right. moral evil. And so if that is likewise, you know, imbued in this end of order, then isn't it sort of incumbent on God um, at, that can, at that contingent stage, we'll say incumbent on God to, to grant the outcome of whatever they have. Yeah, and I think that's Boyd's argument. And my response to that argument is, I'm not sure why God has to let them. Maybe God can let them destroy why, things. Why God has to give them that? Well, yeah, why do they have to have so much power? That, I mean, think about how much power it would take to create a, to, to sort of go to God's universe that was without entropy and be like, you know what, I'm going to have some entropy here. I mean, th that would be a lot of, you know. I, the question is why God would grant them that capacity. Why God would grant them that capacity, and then it would also be, you know, the other question of, but then God's not really our father. Right? I mean, Lucifer is, and that's, we don't want to say that, I don't think. I look forward to reading the chapter in the book. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Other questions? <coughs> if not, uh, let's thank Ryan for you know, uh, loving Hang out, mingle, chat. Uh, there's plenty of cookies.